Warning, this video has proven to make certain viewers up to 15% more likely to touch grass. Viewer discretion advised. Forests are one of the most fundamental staples of fantasy world building. From Mirkwood in The Hobbit, to Pandora in Avatar 2, to all those off-roading Jeep commercials. Make this the summer you never want to come back from. I want to delve into the extreme and inspiring forests that we have here on Earth, how to systematically make forest settings more dynamic for Dungeons and & Dragons and fantasy writing, and the common cultural and mythological implications that forest biomes have on human civilizations. So of course, forests pop up all over the world map, but because they're all growing in different climates, they're gonna grow, function, and feel very different from each other. Now, if you've done some world building before, I'm sure you know some of the general stock packages of forests that people put on their maps. Deciduous forests in the temperate regions that have big, bushy leaves that turn beautiful colors during the autumn, taiga forests in the cold far north and on mountains, with big pine trees that have little water-conserving needles, Rainforests in the hot lowland tropical areas that have lots of water and monkeys. <laughs> Savannas on the edge of grasslands and deserts. And if you're really in the know, maybe the temperate rainforests that sit along the 45 degree latitude line where everything grows huge and mossy and foggy and wet. And it's so, so cool. If you can't tell, I really love forests. On maps, forests can grow in a majority of places because they're so diverse and trees can evolve to fill a ton of different ecological niches. As long as it's not a literal desert, a dry grassland, stony mountaintops, or ice-capped tundra, then trees have a good chance of springing up en masse. This means that you can kind of put forests anywhere on your map, and the more extreme and isolated of a climate that you put them in, the funkier and more unique they'll evolve to be. So when putting forests on a map, I guess the only specific recommendations I'd give that a lot of mountain ranges have lush forests on one side and deserts on the other due to the rain shadow effect. Like, California's Central Valley is all a shrub desert, but once you move up the Sierra Nevadas, it becomes cooler and wetter, and you get these big f***ing sequoia trees. Additionally, along the 45 degree latitude line on the coasts, you'll get strips of these temperate rainforests like I referenced earlier. And on the southern tips of the southern continents, you don't end up with massive taiga forests like you do in the northern hemisphere, because these areas are more geographically isolated. Unique trees and forests that we'll look at in just a second have evolved into these cool biomes. So yeah, you can kind of put forests wherever you want on the map, just intersperse them with plains and meadows, swamps, valleys, all of that stuff at your discretion. Now, in these isolated and extreme environments where trees can grow is where I find my best inspiration for world-building forests. And you know, if you really want to be inspired, subscribe to my channel and like this video. It'll help me sleep at night and it's no cost to you. Now, on the mountain slopes of East Africa, you'll see these forest patches of giant ground soles, which are literally if you took a little rose plant and told it to become a fucking tree. On tropical saltwater coasts, you get these shrubby mangrove trees that can root down into shallow saltwater and form their own sheltered ecosystems. These things smell like absolute sh** to walk through, but they're very cool. They blur the lines between marsh and forest, between land and water. The isolated Socotra Island in Yemen has these big baobab trees. The southern tip of Chile has these windswept temperate rainforests. Tasmania has giant eucalyptus forests with white and rainbow tree trunks. Auckland Island has its super dense and gnarled trees that sprout out looking more like fungi than actual trees. And Campbell Island nearby, every tree in these forests look like a cactus that grew into a bunch of furry leaves. And then Chatham Island, where the trees stand up straight and then scraggle out all hokey pokey like at the top. And lastly, let's look at the giant redwood trees on the northwest Pacific coast, because I actually went out there to look at them. Now the reason these redwoods can get so big is because moisture and water is not as much of a problem for them. Here on the northwest Pacific coast is a temperate rainforest biome. In the morning and in the evening, which we would have been able to get if Ken didn't need to go to fucking In-N-Out Burger this morning. Hey, f you. <laughs> In the morning and in the evening, there's a lot of fog and mist that permeates this area from the Pacific Ocean. And the fact that it's so regular and it's so thick and has a lot of water in it, the redwoods with their little needly leaf boys, they can absorb a ton of that moisture. 
Now one of the biggest problems for trees is that when they get too big, they have a hard time moving moisture and nutrients up from their system. While the redwoods, because the fog and mist is all around them in the air and it's absorbed through the high parts of their leaves and their needles, they don't have to worry about that nearly as much. I know I've kind of gushed about how cool all these forests look, but seriously, I think that if you want to have a unique and fantasy feel to your forest, you gotta look at this stuff for inspiration. So now if you feel a little inspired now, let's consider two things that you can use to set the vibe for your own world building forest. One, what are the big dominant things that are super eye catching? And two, what's the little stuff that's littered all over the place? We just looked at a bunch of the big stuff. When you go into the redwoods, it's really hard to not immediately notice the redwoods. But it's not just the trees themselves, like what surrounds these trees? Are they covered in Spanish moss like the swamps of Louisiana? Do they have giant bunches of berries or mistletoe around them? Do vines crisscross them and create a big messy web among all the trees? Each of these decorations to the big trees can serve a different purpose, however you want to do it. They could be spider webs, they could be fungi, they could even be dead bodies if you're doing a horror thing. This is going to set a major tone for your forest biome. Then you gotta think about what would it literally be like to walk through this forest? What is covering the ground? I grew up in New England, where the ground is always a mess of thorns and brambles, ferns, and decaying wood. That makes it pretty hard to walk through unless there's a path. The native Algonquin tribes that used to live here would purposefully burn all that brush away to open it up for animals and traversal. It was almost like a park. But other places that are wetter and warmer might have a lush forest floor, with big ferns, broadleaf bushes, and frequent streams and puddles all over the place. You can play with a lot of things here. In my opinion, it makes for more natural D&D encounters when the party's treading through the brush, and they accidentally step into a puddle that's full of baby ravenous quipperfish. Or they walk into a badger nest and they step on a baby, as opposed to like, you know, there's a mama bear and her cub plopped down in the middle of the path. So hopefully that gets you thinking about the feel of your sexy forest biome. But in my opinion, even if you are accidentally curb stomping honey badgers, forests still have a problem in how they're presented in fantasy. Oftentimes it's like, you enter a forest, here's your objective in the middle of it, and halfway through you have to fight or flee something mean. If you do this, then the forest becomes like any other backdrop until the ranger starts using a tree for cover. So I've come up with a remedy to make forests a little bit more dynamic while also keeping some realism. Just think about things laterally and vertically. When I say lateral, I'm talking about microbiomes. Wait, no, uh, microclimates. If you walk through a forest, you're actually walking through a patchwork of mini zones where things have slight environmental differences. This can be anything that affects the tree and plant growth. If there's water there, the elevation, the land slope, what's in the soil, is it rocky, did it recently have a fire, is one plant making the soil more acidic, did it get flooded by a river, you get the point. Take a look at this map, this is my Coda Lakes world building project. I have other videos on it, go check them out too, where it has a patchwork of mini biomes and unique places inside of it. Now don't get me wrong, this single forest is my whole world building project, and the mini biomes I'm talking about here function as the normal scale of biomes for the project, so I'm not saying to map out something as detailed as this for every forest that you make, no. Just take notice that if you're walking through a forest, you'll hit a swamp, some rivers, fields, shrublands, hills, gravel pits, cliffs, all of that. I also like to get fantasy with these microbiomes too, so like in the menged woods here, the vines form such a thick knotted web in the treetops that they grow their own moss and soil on them. And then you get a whole nother layer of ground and plants above you. Some areas have firestorms from a big gas leak, giant buried crustaceans that get up every few decades. You see what I'm getting at. Don't treat a forest as just a monolithic thing. It's more interesting if it has a bunch of different areas inside of it that you can draw upon, and make feel like different mini settings in your world building. And secondly, forests are an inherently vertical space. Think about it. Trees go up, and so you can play with that dimension a lot. In real life, vines, hanging moss, climbable branches and fallen trees are all things that can connect the ground floor of the forest up to its understory and treetops. If you run a D&D encounter where a giant evil capybara attacks, some players could climb up into the trees using vines. Yes, the ranger might do that anyways, but other players won't be as easily clued in or able to do so without the vines being there. Or say that there's a deep stream that's full of leaping piranhas and the players need to cross it. They can't just pile stuff up in the river and walk across because a piranha will jump up and bite their dick off. 
So maybe there's a dying tree leaning over the stream, and if they cut it down just right, it'll be high enough to bridge without any danger. Maybe one tree overhead has a bunch of robust seed-filled fibers swaying from it, and if they gather them and twist them all together like a rope, they'll be able to swing across. Hell, maybe they can be carried up there by luring a giant bird to carry them, or get a nearby geyser to launch them. Point is, by getting them to think about the upward dimension, you're getting them interacting with the environment and letting them be more clever with it, which is good for gameplay and making your map feel alive and impactful. I wish it were inherently more interesting to world build civilizations in forests, but it only leads to a few basic things that you probably already know. They have access to wood resources for building, crafting, and selling, they need to spend more time and energy clearing land, and if they want to farm there, they have to burn the plant material's nutrients back into the soil. A woodland civilization usually ends up spreading out and transforming the woods into farmland and plains for their own use, but some forests are definitely kept around and maintained as their own wood resources. These are pretty simple concepts for world building, so if you want to get specific with how your forests affect your civilizations, again, I'd recommend focusing on the specifics of the trees and plants and animals and stuff. Back to the redwoods, the trees naturally break and splinter into pretty clean and straight planks, so the native Wyote and Yurok tribes would build these big wood houses out of all planks. We might be familiar with plank constructions, but these look unique. Additionally, these tribes did something that many, many civilizations do to conserve the resources around them. They respected the trees as sacred. If a community agrees that this important kind of tree is sacred, then they'll need to agree on the appropriate time to cut it down and use it. Otherwise, if people are logging the tree all over the place, you'd be angering the spirit guardians of the redwood trees, and they'd get angry and stop providing, and AKA, you wouldn't have any left to use. Now if your culture believes this way, with the big trees being sacred protector spirits, you're gonna have some pretty good associations with it. And your people's stories about the forests aren't really gonna have witches and werewolves and vampires living out there. But there's a lot of different associations that we see with forests in fantasy and mythology. There'll be things like a place of danger, testing the hero, and survival. This one's really common. You go out there, you fight a monster, you come back with self-discovery and heroism. Or there'll be a place of exile or being lost. The hero loses a battle and has to exile themselves to the forest. Or a place of unknown and mystery. Because you can't see through a thick forest very far, you don't know what's gonna be out there. Witches and werewolves and my nephew Justin, who cooks meth like a motherfucker. Places of natural spirits and natural beauty. You can connect with the gods here. Or a place of timelessness and ancient beings. Maybe a forest is someplace we inherently can't understand because we live and die so quickly compared to them. Or maybe a forest is a last vestige of myth, magic, and fairy tales. It's untouched by modern industrial society. This is what J.R.R. Tolkien was all about. Now, for an interesting example, I saw this meme the other day that goes European forests versus American forests. And I have an interpretation as to why someone would think this. I think it's because American forests tend to be larger, colder, and less developed. They have more wild animals, and the American colonizers haven't had the thousands of years to ingrain them as a familiar part of our culture. They represent a lot more darkness, harshness, and uh, unknownness. And beyond that, in many, many mythologies out there, there appears the sacred tree trope. These can take on a bunch of different flavors that can fit into your stories. Primarily, a microcosm of the cosmos, or an axis mundi, the center of the world, or Yggdrasil, the metaphorical tree that holds all the realms together. Or it could be a ladder to heaven, where some shamans climb up a birch tree in order to bring down the spirits into them. Or the leafing cycle could be about death and resurrection, with an obvious symbology that attunes to the seasons. Or maybe there are spirits that dwell among and within the trees, like the Greek dryads and those forest nymphs. Or it could be a tree of life and healing. The tree's presence and its fruits make it so that everything around it is spiritually healed. 
or it could be a person turned into a tree. These are pretty frequent because oftentimes we see familiar aspects in trees like this. Or a sacred tree's roots could go into the underworld and resurrect dead souls. Or maybe the inverse of that. Being executed on a sacred tree gives you access to its spirit in a certain way. Or maybe you have sentient trees or a sentient whole forest. Or that forest has forest guardians like the Lorax. If you take these two together, then you get the Ents from Lord of the Rings. Or maybe this tree is sacred so the wood itself is made of magic, and anything you craft from it is going to be magic too. Or maybe, and this one is a particular favorite among world building, there's a giant tree that people have built a city inside of. Or maybe a bunch of trees sprouting up, people have built cities around and among. Hopefully now that these sacred tree tropes are laid out, you can mix and match them to create a really good story. I personally like to world build for these kinds of mythological stories, so let me tell you a short story about the mice civilizations from my Coda Lakes world building project. In the cold, windswept forests of the Bowl Lands, there immigrated a tribe of mice with a great king named Meluloth. They founded a city-state in the middle of the area, where all the native tribes would come and trade their goods. And under Meluloth, there was great peace. The city prospered, they cultivated lots of farmland around it, and they built many temples to the gods. One of the princesses, named Anuthix, did her duties as a royal priestess of the nature and fertility goddess Tianti. So she went to a sacred site of the Bold Lands native tribes, a magnificent white tree with blue leaves and running veins of blue sap that sat atop one of the southern hills. In her people's customary worship of Tianti, Anuthix and the priestesses cultivated a sacred garden at the base of the tree. But later, a sorcerer from the southern tribe who owned this hill came to them, and he said, This is the sacred tree of our land. You cannot cultivate it, for its roots and leaves are of our people. And they argued over the land, and the sorcerer eventually allowed them to keep the garden that they had already made, which covered the northern quarter of the tree's base. But in the next days, when Anuthix returned to the sacred tree, she found the sorcerer and his tribe had covered the ground in gravel and salt, and all the garden was killed except for a bush with a single little pepper growing on it. Anuthix ate this pepper, and it made her feel cold, and she received a great vision. She saw the tree poisoned and dying, and it fell on top of her home and city of Wathkran, which was destroyed and plundered, and wrapped in brambles of flaming thorns. So Anuthix ran back to the city and told the priestesses and her family of her vision. But they were all distracted, for King Meluloth was very sick, and he died. In the city's one week of mourning before the prince became the next king, the sorcerer attacked with an army from the southern tribe. For four days they plundered Wathkran and set it ablaze. On the final day they besieged the temples, and Anuthix and three priestesses fled the city together, chased by a pack of vicious tribesmen. They spread out into the woods and climbed the southern hills, and just as the tribesmen were about to grab and abuse them, Tianti reached down and turned them into the same sacred trees. The tribesmen saw this, and they fled, scared to anger the spirits. In the next few weeks, Meluloth's son, Tiafkor, was hastily coronated, and he led an army against the southern tribe, crushing them in battle and taking their land for his own kingdom. He assigned the priestesses of Tianti to cultivate and maintain gardens around each of the trees. And so, the four Anuthix hills in the south were taken and properly worshipped by the Bowl Land Kingdom. This is the story of the conquest and development of the southern tribe's woodlands into the sacred gardens maintained by the priesthood of Anuthix. Thank you all for watching. I hope this helps your world building in the future and gives you some inspiration. Remember to like and subscribe, and have a wonderful day.